all for coming. I hope you all are having a great second day of Digital Inclusion Week. Thank you for spending that time with NDIA. We'll let the room trickle in. This is uh, the most participants we've ever had, or most registered folks we've ever had on a DI 101, at least since I've been here. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a few, a minute or two. While we wait, please, if you can, um, go ahead and put your pronouns and your organization name on your Zoom name. To do that, you could um, put, hover your, your mouse over your face where your video is at, and then click on it. You'll be able to see a drop down menu where you could press rename, and then you could put your pronouns and organization there. That's just helpful so that we refer to you properly if you participate with us. Lots of folks trickling in. We already got 77. Awesome. All right. I will start sharing my screen and then in a few, once uh, the numbers start slowing down, we can get started. So I'm gonna just share my screen. We can all see that. Can I just get a, a thumbs up? Thank you. I always rely on the random person who doesn't know I'm looking at them to give me the thumbs up and Will Booth, you won. <laughs> so thank you for giving me that thumbs up. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Okay, let me just lower that. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Digital Inclusion 101. Um, some housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have come, if you've just joined us now, please put your name, pronouns, and organization that you are with in your Zoom name. That way, if you are participating in the chat or participating with us, we can refer to you properly. So to do that, you just hover your mouse over your face, go ahead and click on it. A drop down menu will, um, will pop up and then you can click rename and then you can add your pronouns, your name and your organization there. All right. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Go ahead and share again your name, pronouns, and organization, and what the weather is looking like over here. It's 72, kind of sunny a little bit, yeah. And um, you will be receiving a copy of this presentation, including the presentation slides that is filled with resources and links. You will also be getting a one pager that has these slides, the recording of this presentation, um, our Jamboard activity, as well as other resources that we share in the chat if they are already not included in these Google Slides. And I'll remind that a few times throughout the presentation because, um, you know, sometimes we get folks trickling in. All right. Well, let's get started. So here is the agenda for today. We will be um, first talking about introducing NDIA. There might be a lot of new folks here who haven't heard of NDIA before. Those just might mean just letters for you and don't worry, we will break it down. Um, then we'll dive into main definitions when it comes to digital inclusion and digi digital equity work. After that, we will shift and talk about the barriers to digital inclusion so we can understand um, a, li a little bit more. After understanding the barriers, then we'll switch over to solutions and we will have our awesome um, policy manager here, Sion, to talk about policy. Um, and with her section, she will be having time afterwards where she can answer any questions that you may have. Um, usually we have the policy section towards the end, um, but just because Digital Inclusion Week is booming, um, we kind of have to reshift. So if you have any specific policy questions, please, 
make sure to have them handy and ready and don't wait till the complete end of the webinar. There will be some time after I can answer any of your questions, but Sion will not be there, our policy expert. Um, so you're just gonna have to deal with me when it comes to policy stuff. And uh, you might as well just take advantage of having the policy manager here, right? And so after um, Sion's policy section, then we'll shift back to me. I'll talk about digital navigators, digital inclusion coalition, and then joining the NDIA community. Um, throughout this presentation, there will be resources that I will be sharing that NDIA has dropped, as well as real examples of what digital inclusion programs look like. Because it's easy to hear something in theory, but seeing it play out is really helpful. All right, so um, here are your presenters for today. I will let Sion introduce themselves and then I'll take it over. Hi, I'm Sion Tesfaye. I'm a research and policy manager here at NDIA. Awesome, thank you Sion. You'll, you'll be hearing more from her in about 20, 30 minutes. So get those policy questions ready. And hello everybody, I am Pamela, she, hers. I'm the training and community engagement manager. I reside in Kickapoo land, Chicago. And um, I'm very excited to be here with you all. Again, this is our biggest DI 101 um, participant as of, as of late. All right, so. Let's talk about NDIA. So NDIA stands for the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and we advance digital equity by supporting community programs and equipping policymakers to act. We are a nonprofit organization, and we represent and serve more than 900 U.S. organizations in 48 states that are working towards affordable broadband, access to devices, and digital skills training and support. And I also want to acknowledge our tribal partners and the amazing work that they are doing to bring connectivity and digital inclusion in Indian country. And NDIA is very happy and grateful to be partners with tribe uh, with 12 tribal entities. And we are privileged to be working alongside them, um, alongside these tribal led organizations. And we have tribal led organizations in our digital navigator core, and they include the Alaska Federation of Natives, Chaos Native Solutions, Cherokee Nation, Gila River Broadcasting Corporation, um, specifically the Digital Connect Initiative, Hoopa Valley Public Utilities District, the Lumi Indian Business Council, and Pueblo of Jemez. So here at NDAA, we facilitate knowledge sharing forums, such as our monthly community calls that I host. Um, we also have working group meetings. Um, Sion hosts the ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program Working Group. And we also have our very um, popular NDIA listserv. And so after learning from our community through these knowledge sharing platforms, we draw major themes from what we've learned and then we align our advocacy efforts with that, whether that is creating um, a lot of resources from what we're hearing on the ground. So those resources I will be sharing with you all as it is relevant to each of the solutions that we will cover. All right, let's talk about some key definitions. When talking about digital inclusion, sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, but they each mean specific things. So first we have digital equity, which we like to say is the goal, right? It's the condition in which all individuals, all members of our community has the ability to get online and use it the way that they want to. At the start of the pandemic, I was working at a domestic violence shelter, and I think we can all remember how everything went remote that could go remote, right? And that also included court hearings, but those dates didn't change. So at the shelter, we had to rush and figure out how are we going to make sure our clients get to those virtual court hearings? Because digital equity, digital divide was not something that we were thinking about because the clients would come to the office, right? So we would have clients, you know, um, reaching under the cover to get those laptops. And then we found out, oh man, those, those laptops, they don't have the updated software to download Zoom. They don't have either internet connection or their internet connection is not stable enough to even last 10 minutes. 
And let's say it did, do they know how to access their email account? Maybe they do have an email, but they forgot their password and they don't know how to access that. For folks who have the digital skills to quickly um, put that, you know, their number in to get the code and then, you know, this isn't that, that could be a five minute process. But for somebody who doesn't know and who is in a panic and on top of that connectivity is not reliable, it was a chaos. So that's something that I like to share when it comes to um, connectivity and the digital divide, because it does deal with people's lives and safety. And we all saw that when we went remote. And NDAA also, we have the privilege of joining the tribal broadband boot camps. And through this, we've learned that digital equity is especially relevant to tribal communities through way of cultural preservation, language preservation, engaging with tribal elders and staying connected to vulnerable members within the community. So when it comes to um, digital equity, how do we get there? How do we get to the state in which everybody in our communities can use the internet and use it the way that they want to? And that is through digital inclusion. And it's the work that you are all doing here. So these are the activities that are necessary to achieve digital equity. And um, we'll go into detail in the next few slides about what these activities look like specifically. All right, so the digital divide. We've got um, digital equity, which is the goal, digital inclusion, that's the work, and digital divide, it's the issue. So it's that gap between those who have affordable access, skills, and support to effectively engage online and those who do not. And the digital divide disproportionately affects those who are already impacted by oppressive systems like racism, classism, age discrimination, and much more. All right. So this graph is from the 2019 American Community Survey, and um, you can see that the, dig the digital divide disproportionately impacts Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, Black people at higher rates. And so, um, you know, that saying of a picture is worth a thousand words, well, this picture is incomplete. And the census has historically undercounted Native Americans, especially those who are living in reservations, as well as Alaska Natives living in villages. It's not taking into account multi-generations that live in homes. And that is usually very typical in Native, Black, Latino, Asian, and immigrant homes. And also, um, let's look at all the way to the right. Uh, that is the Asian race and ethnicity all the way to the right. And um, you see there in action, the model minority myth. Um, because we are not disaggregating the data for Asian Americans, you might see this and think, wow, Asian, the Asian American community might not need uh, digital equity work or digital inclusion because they're not affected by the digital divide as much. However, Asian Americans are, um, they have the biggest wealth gap of any ethnic group. Higher rates of poverty exist in um, ethnic enclaves like Southeast Asian communities. And when it comes to education attainment, 40% of Cambodian and Hmong individuals have not completed high school and 62% of Bhutanese individuals lack a high school degree. So when you look at those indicators of what contributes to the digital divide of um, low income and education rate, you see those happening most in Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities. But because the data is not disaggregated, you, will, you might look at this and think the Asian community might not need those um, you know, digital skills trainings because they already they, they have access to device. They don't have to deal with um, income inequality. So I like to put this out there that graphs are helpful to see who is not being impacted, but I also invite you all to look more and not rely just on numbers. All right, so we're going to be doing a quick activity um, for those who are new to Jamboard, it's essentially a visual whiteboard where we can add sticky notes. Here is the instructions to that. Um, the link to the Jamboard will be in the chat, which you all can access. So in order to add a 
sticky note, you're just going to go to the left module and the fourth icon there, you click on that. Then step two, you could write anything you want in there um, and then press save. So let's all go to that. I will pause my screen and then the next thing you'll see is the Jamboard. And I want you all to answer the question of what prevents people in your community from consistently connecting to the internet and using it effectively? We'll spend a few minutes there. And if you're entering, please um, move your sticky notes because they all kind of just populate in one specific area. All right, money. Yes, money is a huge barrier for um, somebody being able to access the internet, whether it's money to get a internet subscription, to starting a internet subscription, or even getting a device. No or limited broadband. Yes, they might live in rural areas or um, in areas where the infrastructure is not there. Cost, no access. Um, don't own a device that can connect to the internet. Absolutely. Either the device is not able to connect or um, they don't have the skills. They don't know how to connect it. Um, unease, lack of familiarity with technology. Thank you for whoever wrote that, absolutely. Sometimes trust is the most difficult barrier, um, but they're all, pretty, they're all pretty difficult. But when you see somebody, if you're somebody who is scared, who does not trust the internet because you see um, big companies getting their information and data getting hacked, and you might think, well, I'm just one person, that's enough to stay away from you know, taking the time to learn about uh, the certain devices and learn the skills and, you know, pay for a plan. Some consistent barriers for us include lack of infrastructure, lack of affordable devices, and lack of skills to access the internet and, effect and use it effectively. Thank you. Um, other responsibilities competing for time, such as learning how to use a computer versus working many jobs. Thank you for whoever wrote that. Exactly, that speaks to um, low income communities, right? Um, time is a luxury, unfortunately now. And so if you are, if you have to make the choice of spending the next two hours learning how to use and type a keyboard properly, or that's work so you can afford some food for your family, I think, um, I think we all know what the choice is there, especially in this economy and these gas prices. Um, what else? Language, culture, social barriers, absolutely. Um, if there are no trainings available in that specific language, if you are um, English second language, if you are um, uh, uh, not proficient in, in English, but you are proficient in another language, and all of those training classes and um, manuals and tutorials are all in a different language, uh, it's going to be very difficult and very easy to get frustrated and stop. Live in an area that don't get Wi-Fi, lack of device, no internet service providers. Yeah, absolutely. Some consistent barriers, lack of education and knowledge of how to use devices or the internet. Awesome. Thank you all for participating. Um, Y'all know what you're talking about, so hopefully you can still learn something from this DI 101, um, and you will have access to this Jamboard, so if this is going to be helpful for you in the future, um, feel free to use some of these examples that other people are um, have shared about their, what, what the, the disconnect um, of connectivity and using it effectively in their communities. All right, I'm going to switch back to the presentation slides. All right, so let's jump into some key barriers. All right, so key barriers. First one is broadband. And um, these three barriers that we're focusing on are more of the key ones that we're seeing. However, there are plenty of barriers that exist that is limiting why somebody will not be either using the internet or having the, the, the skills to use the internet or having the connection properly, um, but we're just going to be covering the three ones. 
So, all right, first we have um, broadband and um, broadband inequity. So many households still do not have access to the internet. And so we have a few reasons why. So we have digital redlining. Um, digital redlining is discrimination by internet service providers in deployment, maintenance, upgrade, or delivery of services. We also have um, complexities of land ownership rights in tribal lands. Um, high cost internet plans. A lot of people were talking about affordability. Um, it, it's expensive to start an internet plan. Um, and even though there are programs that Sian will talk more about that do exist to um, cut that cost, um, either people might not know about it or they might have been scammed by people who have been pretending that they are providing those services or um, the application process is just too difficult and frustrating and they just don't have time for that. And then lastly, that unreliable service, which I saw a few folks writing in, in, the, um, in the Jamboard, where you do have internet service, there is connectivity, however, it keeps going out whenever the weather is not sunny and when is it always going to be sunny, right? Um, and, and things like that, because either the infrastructure is not up to date or um, the type of connectivity just is not, is not reliable for the needs of what the person wants to do with. The next one, the next barrier here is devices. So some of the, the barriers when it comes to devices is um, the device is not matching the needs of the user, which I also saw people write, wrote in the Jamboard activity. So we will uh, talk about the different pros and cons of the three popular devices, the smartphone, tablet, and laptop in a few slides. So I won't go into it much, but it is important for people to be able to make the right choice of what device they're going to be putting their money into. Um, and they have to uh, you know, be aware that a tablet will not do everything that a cell phone will do or a laptop will do, especially for folks who where income is tight and they put their money into a device and it's not what they need, that can be really difficult. Um, high cost. Uh, Devices can be very expensive. There are ways to cut costs on that. There are programs to cut costs on that, but some people might not know of it or they might not trust it. There is no access to a device at all. Um, and then the, 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 the software is outdated. So they cannot download Zoom for their class or the court hearings that I was sharing earlier, um, things like that. And then the last barrier that we're gonna be talking about is those digital skills. And as we've seen with the pandemic, remote work is driving demand for digital skills. Um, those higher paying jobs do require having some type of digital skills. I mean, the basics of you know knowing how to send an email in terms of when it comes to even just getting a new job, right? Writing up a resume, who's who's mailing resumes anymore <laughs> you know what I mean like think about the job you have right now you most likely emailed that and for those who don't have those skills don't have connectivity um don't know how to do that thing um it will be very limiting in terms of their job prospects um other things that we have discussed in the jam board is that trainings are not accessible that fear and lack of trust um, especially if those government programs are providing um, a benefit so that they can get these devices either for free or at a very reduced cost. There might be, there are communities that have been harmed by the federal government and they do not trust that, right? Privacy and security concerns, fear of being hacked. Um, that's a very real and valid fear because we've seen big companies and organizations get hacked. And also shame. We see this a lot, um, especially for those who are older adults who are trying to learn. They might feel um, stupid and nobody wants to feel stupid, but especially if you're going into a class where everybody is younger than you, that shame of, wow, I should have known how to do this, yet here I am. Um, also shame of asking a question or asking for clarification, especially if somebody is um, English second language um, and you're seeing everybody in your class kind of getting it right away, but you're not. Um, and regardless of whether or not there's a language barrier there, there's a lot of shame that comes with that. And we hear that a lot with 
folks who are librarians and those who work with um, veterans is that shame as well as that fear. All right, so now that we've covered the key barriers, it's very easy to then identify what the solutions are. And so we'll go through each of these with um, real life actions or real life examples of digital inclusion programs working on these specific things. All right, let me just check the, the chat. Michael Sanders, Logan Square. Um, I'm in Logan Square, that's so funny. Um, I'm just looking through the chat. Digital inclusion stores, awesome. Thank you everybody who is sharing um, things in the chat. This is what we love to see. This is the community that we like to have. People who are resource sharing, sharing what's working for them, things that they've seen that's helpful. All right. So first one, let's talk about um, the solution of affordable and low cost broadband. So what is broadband? Broadband is the transmission of wide bandwidth data over a high speed internet connection. And so in 2015, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, defines the minimum standard for broadband speed as 25 Three. So 25 megabits per second for downloading and three megabits per second for uploading. And um, as I was new nine months ago, those numbers, I don't know what those mean. So we're going to do a fun little trivia. All right. Trivia question number one. Mm -hmm. So how much download speeds would a family of four individuals need if that family has five devices connected to the internet? have two people working from home or remote learning at the same time, and they're streaming videos in HD as well as playing video games. What do y'all think? You think they need 36 um, megabits per second for downloading, 63, 85, or 100? Let's see. A lot of y'all are putting D. We'll wait a few more. All righty. Okay. Thanks all for um, participating. Um, the answer is D. So you would actually need 100 megabits um, per second for downloading. All right. And so with broadband adoption, this is daily access to the internet at speeds, quality, and capacity necessary to accomplish the common tasks or the goals that they're wanting. Um, with digital skills that are necessary to participate online, as well as on a personal device um, that is secure and in a convenient network. Let me just make sure everybody is on mute. Um, Okay, thank you. All right, so when it comes to um, tribal sovereignty and broadband, um, sovereignty is extremely important in tribal communities. So tribes that are owning and operating their internet infrastructure, um, those that supports native nation sovereignty by keeping that power and data within tribal communities, as well as safety from safety with cybersecurity. And it also bolsters the tribe's economic power by creating more jobs and create and keeping that economy of um, the 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 income that is generated from ISPs within the tribal communities. All right, last trivia question, then I'm passing it along um, to Sion. So what city was ranked the best work from home city in 2021 by PC Mag? You can go ahead and guess in the chat. We're getting a lot of Ds. <laughs> Mauricio put E. Love thinking outside the box. Okay. All right. The answer is D, Chattanooga, Tennessee, also known as Gig City. Um, Chattanooga is the first city in the US to roll out a citywide fiber network in 2010. And since August, 2020, um, the HCS Ed Connect program 
provided free high-speed Wi-Fi to approximately 28,500 students in 18,000 households who qualify for free or reduced lunch. All right, so I promised you all resources from NDIA. And one of my favorite resources is this affordable connectivity program page. Um, Sian will go a little bit more on that, uh, that program. Um, however, this resource page will include resources from the FCC as well as answers from the community that we have seen the, the same questions over and over again, as well as ACP updates from NDIA. And the second resource that we have for you is the free and low cost internet plans page. So this was designed to be helpful for digital inclusion practitioners like yourself who will give guidance to clients and constituents. So this is great for those who are working in libraries if you're a digital navigator, which we'll talk more of. Um, and they kind of break it down into um, plans that are ACP only, um, plans that are low cost, low cost plans, and then low cost plans that um, do not have eligibility requirements. All right, so uh, passing it over to Sian, who will talk more about policy, and then we'll spend some time answering any questions. And then after that, um, it'll be back to me. Thank you, Pamela. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the funding and the programs uh, that are devoted to a lot of those important pillars of uh, digital inclusion that Pamela uh, spent the last 30 minutes talking about. Um, I'll say up front, um, if this is a lot to absorb, which I think it is, even though I'm going to try to keep it uh, somewhat succinct, um, we have resources on our website, um, both webinars and blog posts that break uh, some of this down um, and for you to have uh, at hand for reference later on. But um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I want to give you just this sort of um, uh, this sort of a baseline of some of the funding that we have to work with. So in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, there's been this huge historical investment um, in broadband and digital equity. So the Digital Equity Act is a part of that. Um, and this is really the culmination of a few decades of work, um, a real grassroots effort to make digital equity uh, a policy priority with prominent recognition and funding to support it. Um, and a lot of this money is going to go towards, um, you can kind of think of it as like a block grants for states um, to develop those digital equity plans um, and to, to rev up the capacity to actually implement those plans. So more on that in a second. Um, we have the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. Sometimes for short, you'll hear it referred to as BEAD, the BEAD program. And this is um, primarily to fund uh, some of the infrastructure that's necessary to help uh, completely unserved communities get connected, but also unserved, underserved communities get connected as well. So those communities who don't have access um, at, su at sufficient speeds. Uh, Pamela's touched on this a little bit, the Affordable Connectivity Program. So you might remember the predecessor to this program was the Emergency Broadband Benefit, which helped people stay connected during the pandemic and it got sort of formally extended into uh, ACP. Um, so sort of the recognition that affordability was a problem before the pandemic, and it's gonna be a challenge after the pandemic too. So there's funding there to address that. Uh, the Tribal Connectivity Program, this is funding for tribal uh, governments to fund um, you know, deployment, um, uh, broadband deployment on tribal lands. The Middle Mile Connectivity Program is another kind of uh, infrastructure um, uh, infrastructure funding for um, bringing high-speed internet to different communities. And uh, also importantly, there's a section in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, really getting at the issue of digital discrimination. So it's Congress recognizing that you know, there might be a problem um, and directs the FCC to uh, develop uh, rules to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination. And um, can also talk about that a little bit more later, but um, there's a process, a series of steps that the FCC is going to take to first try to learn about how people characterize what this problem is. 
um, before they get into the process where they will eventually propose rules and ask for the community's input on those as well. Um, so we're kind of in the process now. The FCC has um, initiated an inquiry into this problem, um, had asked for community feedback to help them characterize it, understand it, how different people interpret it. And then um, we're sort of waiting now um, for them to uh, possibly propose rules. And then they're going to seek community input again on those proposed rules. Um, and then at some point, we will end up with um, some framework to address the problem uh, holistically. Okay, well now I'll get into the Digital Equity Act programs. So um, I mentioned, you can kind of think of it as a block grant and kind of where we are now with this is that, um, you know, states have already indicated uh, their interest and plans to participate in the program. And pretty soon, Towards the end of the year, we're going to see a lot more states beginning getting funds to begin the planning process. Um, and the important um, thing I'll mention about this is that it's it's not intended to be completely top down. So the states state leadership just deciding, you know, here's what we think um, a good digital equity plan should look like. Now everybody go do it. There are uh, stakeholder engagement requirements that uh, states have to abide by to make sure that they're getting. Uh, community input for these plans, um, because these plans are intended to give primacy to people who have been um, historically marginalized, people who have felt the digital divide um, in the most acute ways. Um, so it's really important for states to be talking with um, organizations that serve, for example, um, you know, aging individuals or, um, you know, uh, community-based organizations that support people who were formerly incarcerated, uh, organizations that support um, individuals who have, um, who are part of racial or ethnic minority groups, et cetera. And in addition to um, engaging with organizations that represent them, they actually need to be engaging directly with what we call people who um, have lived experiences uh, with the digital divide. So, that's the encouraging thing about this program, and we're um, really encouraging people to, uh, you know, be proactive and engaging with the state in the planning process. Um, and then later on to follow, uh, there will be funding for uh, what we call the capacity grant. So that's sort of the funding necessary to implement those plans. And then uh, much later down the line, there will be uh, the competitive grant program. Okay, so ACP. Um, so where we are with this is, um, well, first I'll say, you know, this is um, an incredible program to really help with that, um, with that important pillar of affordability. Um, you know, it's it's thirty dollars a month uh, for eligible households. Um, on tribal lands, it's more. It's um, up seventy five dollars, and there's also a component to help people access um, devices they need to connect to the internet. So. Um, up to a hundred dollars benefit for that as well. Um, one of the things organizations have been really looking forward to is getting some funding uh, for outreach to raise the vis visibility of this program. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of people that you know may not be aware that this program exists or um, are a little bit lost in, in trying to navigate how to apply for the program. Um, so there will be um, outreach grant funding available for that. We actually have a webinar where we talk at length about it. Um, funding window hasn't opened yet for it, but we expect it to open soon. Um, so that's another thing to look out for with ACP. The BEAD program. So I mentioned that this is um, addressing that um, infrastructure component. Um, making sure that people who don't have access to broadband or have very limited um, access to broadband um, will get served. So although I kind of characterized it as an infrastructure program, that it does need to be linked with uh, the Digital Equity Act program. So um, it's, it's not the case that equity is a part of the Digital Equity Act programs, but none of the infrastructure programs, um, it's really, they're really intended to complement each other. And um, there really should be, um, you know, an analysis for equity uh, within the implementation of the BEAD program as well. 
And this is a slide, this actually just has a breakdown on some of our um, policy and advocacy positions. Um, it has a link to the series, I mentioned the webinars that we talk about, uh, the funding opportunities for the Digital Equity Act programs. And um, there's a, probably a few more links I can drop in the chat really quickly that get at some of the newer blog posts that we have that break down um, the outreach grant program that is gonna be really crucial to help uh, people with their outreach efforts for the Affordable Connectivity Program. Okay, so went through a lot. <laughs> Happy to take your questions or direct you to exactly where you can find them if I don't have them offhand, but. Yeah, thank you so much, Sion. Uh, I know you have to leave in a few minutes. So um, somebody, uh, Frank asked, has anyone heard anything about the ACP Outreach Grant Program? NOFO wanted to see if it's released or if FTC is still working on it. Yeah, I actually expect that to be released very, very soon. Like I, I was, I've been expecting it this week. I uh, have not seen it. I'm checking uh, uh, very frequently on the website <laughs> and I'm looking at all my emails. Um, so that is not here yet, but it will be here very, very soon. And when it is here, we will be very loud about it. So you'll know. <laughs> Yes, um, please join our community. We will post it on our listserv as well as have a blog post on it as well. Um, Gigi asks, how about micro and small businesses in reference to the ACP and BEAD funding? The ACP outreach funding? Yes. Yes. Right. Um, so um, more information will be in the notice of funding opportunities, but it is gonna be open to like you don't have to, organizations don't have to be a nonprofit entity. So it, it, it you know, potentially if, if you're a, um, you know, for-profit entity that has a connection to a lot of the communities, um, I, I think in the, the outreach grant report and order, they call it populations of focus. Um, so, you know, there is kind of a way that they're going to kind of privilege or the applications and, um, you know, um, organizations that have really strong connections to those who most likely do not have uh, access to affordable uh, internet um, will, will, you know, be kind of privileged in the application process. But the NOFO will explain that more. Um, I don't, I don't want to overspeak, but there's enough information that I have to let me know that you, um, you're, you're going to likely need to demonstrate that you have a, a connection to the communities that they're, they're trying to reach. So awesome. the short answer to your question is it's it's not restricted to nonprofits. Okay, um, and Will with T3, um, thank you for putting that clarification in the chat. Um, Christina writes, is there any other source for gaining access to tabling for ACP? Uh, I don't think I know what that means. Uh, access to tabling, you mean like hosting, like sign up events, things like that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. the outreach grant program is going to uh, support a lot of outreach activity. Um, you're going to see that explained in greater details in the NOFO, but yes, they want to support outreach and uh, enrollment efforts. Awesome. And then um, I know you only have two minutes left. Um, Melo wrote, when will these program fundings open? Uh, are you uh, talking about the ACP outreach grant program? Sorry, I can't see the question, so I, I wasn't yeah. sure. If, if you're wondering about the ACP, the out for money for outreach, um, I, I expect to see it definitely this month. I'm actually expecting it um, you know, within the next week. Um, to support or the what we call the notice of funding opportunity uh, where people can apply for funding. So you're not gonna see funding right away. There's still gonna be an application process, but that's gonna open very, very soon. Awesome. And you have one minute left. So George asks, um, the ADA has been notoriously slow to officially include digital web accessibility. Is there anything in the discussed programs that specifically speak to accessible tech and training? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, so I'll say first, um, when I talked about the Digital Equity Act programs and what states are going to need to address, and um, they are going to need to uh, address barriers for people who are living with disabilities. And um, the solutions are going to look different depending on uh, the state and 
what the state's baseline is. Um, but that is a community that is definitely explicitly sort of uplifted for focus um, as a focus area for the Digital Equity Act. Awesome. I know you are at time. So everybody give a round of applause to Sion because she kills it every time. Um, Sion, could you please put your, your uh, email in the chat? Um, and the, her email will be on the slides as well at the end, but in case somebody wanted to ask you a question now. Ryan is clapping. <laughs> awesome. All right. Contact information is in the chat for those who um, want to um, talk with Sion a little bit more. All right. Thank you, Sion. And um, thank you for joining us. All right, y'all. Okay, back to back to me. All right, so let's get back to solutions. Um, the next one that we will be talking about is appropriate and affordable devices, which a lot of y'all have mentioned um, in the Jamboard activity. So here is a fun little chart. Um, and I also have a link of a really awesome fact sheet um, called Expanding Device Availability for Broadband that um, ILSR and NDIA worked on together. So if you are wanting more information about um, these kind of pros and cons, uh, that fact sheet will actually have the fourth device, which is a desktop on there with more details of pros and cons for all of these different devices. So um, again, that will be all linked when I send out the recording of this webinar, as well as the slides and the links that we've shared in the chat. So let's kind of go through some of the pros and cons of these devices here. So we've got the smartphone, right? It's perfect because it's small, portable um, to charge it. You don't really need a lot, right? It's like a little outlet thingy that you just plug, you know, like this big long linky thing. Um, there's multiple connection options. Um, it's usually you know, long battery, depending if you're using TikTok for an hour straight, may, might not be that long, um, but it does not replace a laptop. Um, it does not replace what you would need a laptop to do in order to work remotely or study remotely. Next, we have the tablet. It is great for accessibility. It is touchscreen. The screen is big. You can change the, um, the keyboard into different languages, and that might be more accessible for people, whether that's physical accessibility or language accessibility. Um, it does have a longer battery compared to a smartphone. Um, however, if you are looking to make calls with it, you cannot do that unless you have a cellular data plan. Um, and that might be a, a misunderstanding that people have. They put money into a tablet. It's nice. They think it's going to do everything that they need, but except for the, the main thing they need it for, the basic thing of making a call. Um, and then lastly, we have here the laptop. It's mandatory for a lot of jobs and applications um, because it has the applications necessary to fulfill that job requirement. Um, it has large storage. However, it is a little bit shorter of a battery life and it's the least affordable option compared to the other two. So for somebody who thinks that, oh, I can just get a tablet instead of buying a laptop, but their job or their class actually needs them to get a laptop, um, but they've already paid that money, you can see the, the, the issue there. All right, and again, there's a link here to um, access more of the pros and cons as well as information about desktops. So one example of a digital inclusion organization is Computer Reach. They are awesome. They are a Pittsburgh-based nonprofit organization, and they make technology available to people most in need through refurbished equipment, computer literacy training, and support. And another resource that NDIA has is our startup manual. So our startup manual is perfect for organizations that are looking to start a digital inclusion program or just at the beginning phase. It walks you through um, what a digital, a community digital inclusion program looks like. What are some basic questions that you should reflect on before you get started. Um, and it, when it comes to devices, it kind of gives you examples of different types of refurbishers. So you could do do-it-yourself PC refurbishing, working with established nonprofit refurbishers and stuff like that. It also goes into digital skills training. Um, if that is an avenue that you are 
wanting to do. It kind of gives you a checklist of what you need to consider before you start that. Or if you're early on, um, things like who's going to be training them. What is your, who's your demographic? And then who are the teachers? Do they match? Um, will it be free? Will there be costs involved? Uh, is it going to be completely virtual? Is it going to be in person? Are you going to do a hybrid? All of those things um, you need to think about when starting that. So you are not alone. We do have that startup manual for you. And we are currently working on a revised and updated one. So um, join our community. We will announce it on the listserv once it is updated. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, we've got a few things to cover. Um, the next solution is the, that digital skills training. So um, we have here the essential digital skills framework. This is what we like to um, refer to when talking about, you know, do you have those foundational skills? So things like, can you turn on a device when the, the, the client or patron has a device? Do they know the start and uh, the on and off button? Do they know where that's located? Do they know if there's a home button? Do they know how to access it? Do, you, do they know how to access back to their home screen? Do they know what all of the functionalities do on their device? Can they turn it off? Can they turn it on? Can they increase and decrease the volume, silence it? Um, can they, do they know how to download an app? Do they know how to delete their app? Do they know how to connect to their internet, um, change their, their, their password if necessary, do some basic troubleshooting, things like that. So that essential digital skills framework is really helpful when looking at, okay, what are some basic skills that will really help somebody when it comes to having a new device or even navigating their device and the internet. And um, one awesome organization that I want to highlight is Digital Connect Initiative. They are created by Gila River Telecommunications and a Digital Connect Initiative promotes digital inclusion in the Gila River Indian community. And they are one of our partners um, in the DN uh, Navigator Corps. So they provide digital skills training such as dig digital literacy focused on telehealth. Um, assisting digital transformation for veterans and serving military, and they also have monthly digital skills training. Awesome work that they are doing over there. And as far as NDIA resources, we've got digital skills training. Uh, we've got um, a blog that is written by Lo, um, and it's about five digital literacy resources you need to know about. Here are some digital um, skills training websites if you're looking for multilingual resources. We've got digitallearn.org, GCF Learn Free, and then we have also other resources like Tech Boomers um, and Mozilla Foundation, which is perfect if um, you are a facilitator looking for um, more resources. All right, digital navigators. So y'all might have heard about the digital navigator model. So we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So the digital navigators, they are individuals who address the whole digital inclusion process, such as home connectivity, finding affordable, low cost internet in their area. Um, it's also including helping somebody find a device um, that is low cost and affordable for them, as well as um, digital skills training to use their device, connect to the internet and, and do what they need to do, right? So these are community members um, that are meeting with a digital navigator through repeated interactions. And they are trained to assess a community member's needs and completely guide them through um, uh, resources that are suitable for their skill level and lifestyle. So whether that is learning how to um, apply or learning how to set up an email or um, more, more intense stuff like through jobs. All right, so um, I see that we have somebody in the audience from T3, Tribal Tech Warriors. <laughs> um, so Tribal Tech, Tribal Technology Training, or T3, they are a tribal-led program developed to increase workforce opportunities for the native community. And they also do other digital equity things like addressing connectivity issues. And so they have a digital navigator program called the Tribal Tech Warrior Program. And they, divide, uh, they provide those digital skills training. Um, and afterwards, individuals can receive a certificate that they can show their employer. So some of those skills are those basic computer skills, Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And I had the awesome Awesome pleasure of being on a panel and meeting Andrea, the executive director of Tribal Tech Training, um, who shared more about Tribal Tech Warriors and how um, she really took the digital navigator program and remixed it to make it sense to her community 
So instead of calling it digital navigators, it's tribal tech warriors. And that is really amazing. And that's what we love to see, taking the model and applying it and um, making it fit with your community the best way. Here's another digital navigator program. Um, it, they are digital navigators at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and they taught their um, healthcare providers how to um, use the smartphone and have, have those basic skills so that they can teach their patients um, if there are any issues, how to troubleshoot their phone, how to download those specific apps, um, how to stay organized using a smartphone, things like that. All right, so we do have a nav digital navigators homepage where you can learn more about the model as well as access resources like skills assessments, follow-up surveys, a baseline digital navigator job description if you are looking to hire, um, what an intake form and exit form survey looks like, and then more information like a webinar and a digital navigator toolkit. All right, so I'll briefly talk about digital inclusion coalitions. So digital inclusion coalitions, they are they exist. They um, exist because you're not alone in what you're doing. Um, there are organizations maybe that exist in your community that are um, tackling other aspects of digital equity work and you might be doing um, digital skills. There might be somebody that's focusing on connectivity. There might be somebody else focusing on devices. So that is what is comprising of these digital inclusion coalitions. They're a, they're a collective of organizations whose main goal is digital equity for that community. So they could raise funding for digital inclusion programs and overall raise awareness of digital inequities that exist in your community. So these are the type of organizations that get involved with these coalitions, you see nonprofits, libraries, social work, um, state government, sometimes internet service providers, truly dependent on your community. And one example is the Bronx Digital Equity Coalition. So at the start of the pandemic, the Bronx Community Foundation, as part of the Bronx Community Relief Effort, they gathered 30 institutions in the Bronx who were providing digital resources and services in the community. And they met on a weekly basis to discuss challenges that they were facing. And then they partnered up with um, community organizations to bring over 2,000 Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots to students during that year. Here is another um, Digital Inclusion Coalition, the Digital Inclusion Network, DIN in Portland. Um, they're comprised of over 45 organization members and um, they guide the, the state's digital equity action plan and implementation efforts. A resource that we have for you is our Digital Inclusion Coalition guidebook. Here is a sneak peek of one of the pages um, that talks about the coalition development process. Um, you will hear from 23 expertise from 23 different coalitions about best practices, lessons learned on the field, and how coalitions are structured and what are some key successful um, takeaways. And then lastly, we have the Digital Inclusion Trailblazers um, resource. This is a public inventory of local government initiatives that are promoting digital literacy broadband access for underserved residents. So in this year, we actually named the largest group that we've ever named 32 Digital Inclusion Trailblazers. Um, and so this is something really helpful if you are looking for what local government is doing what and what they can improve on. All right, we've got one minute left. So um, lastly, I want to invite y'all to join the NDIA community. If you are overwhelmed, if you are hyped because of Digital Inclusion Week, but you don't know where to start or you have so many questions, we are the place for you. We have that listserv available. We have that community call where we bring in experts that share resources and tools and things that are working and lessons that they've learned. Um, and you'll also have access to our monthly newsletter. All right, and then lastly, coming in um, next year is Net Inclusion, our annual conference. It will be in San Antonio from February 28th to March 2nd. Again, mark your calendars because it is some really good information on there. We'll have a lot of workshops that will be helpful and covering all aspects of digital equity. But our um, the one that we did in this year was in Portland, and all of those videos and workshops are all on our website and YouTube page. 
And here is my contact information, Pamela at digitalinclusion.org, as well as Sion's. Um, I know we are exactly at two o'clock. Um, I will look at the chat to see if there's any questions. Um, I want to say thank you all for joining me and joining us at NDIA during this awesome and really busy Digital Inclusion Week. I hope that you learned something. Expect by the end of today to receive a one pager that includes the recording of this webinar, as well as the webinar slides and all of those really helpful links to get you started in your work. So excited for you all. Thank you all for being part of this movement. And I know you're going to do great things in your community. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes and then we will close up the room. Thanks for the, the hand clap emoji. Um, in the one pager, there will also be a survey that you could fill out so that we can improve our DI 101 in the future. Thanks all. Thanks, Will. They have been dropping a lot of useful resources in the chat and answering questions. Really appreciate that. Follow us on socials. We're posting a lot of good stuff that's happening around Digital Inclusion Week. Go on our website to learn more about Digital Inclusion Week and what other organizations are doing. And I hope your organization is doing some fun things for your community as well. All right, y'all.